Good morning, everyone. Good morning, everyone. Hey. Um, we welcome you to Union Street. Uh, thanks for joining us today. Today is a very special day. We have a lot of great things going on in this house. Um, even though the Christmas season seems so busy and so exhausting, we just need to slow down and remember what is the reason of the season and remember that quality time with your family is the important thing to, as well. So let's all keep that in mind today and um, we welcome you to stand and we're, we're actually gonna speed things up a little bit. <laughs> okay, please stand.
may be seated. My name is Angela. It is my joy to welcome you this morning as we come in this third Advent to come and celebrate all that God is doing in our midst. And I just have a few announcements, just if you have a bulletin. If you uh, regularly attend Union Street, you have mail in your mailbox, and we just, there's different Christmas cards, a Christmas letter, and we'd love for you to pick that up today before you leave. We really appreciate that. As well, tonight, we have been doing praise and prayer at various locations around our Charlotte County, and tonight is at Gateway Cathedral at 6 o'clock. And this has just been an incredible time of, of worship and getting together with other churches. And each time I have left, I have just been so inspired and encouraged what God is doing in our midst. And I truly believe when believers, and particularly when churches get together, man, incredible things happen, that God's kingdom is being built. Because as I said it before, building God's people kingdom is bigger than one person, it's bigger than one church, it's bigger than one denomination, that he has called all of us to join him among as followers of Jesus to come and do that together. So I just, if you don't have plans, I invite you to come at Gateway at six o'clock. Nobody will ask you to pray out loud or anything like that. It's just a great time of community and fellowship. So that's that. Next Sunday night is our Christmas Eve service at 6 p.m., and we just encourage you to come back out. This is a great time to invite a family member or a neighbor to come. 
It's just a wonderful service. I call it controlled chaos sometimes because uh, there's lots of kids. It's a multi-generational. We, we have kids taking part and youth taking part. And, of course, Dan and I are taking part. So it's just a wonderful evening. Candlelights. We'll be lighting candles and kids will be doing glow sticks. So just encourage you to come back out for that as well. One of our organizations that is near and dear to our heart that started in our church and we continue to partner with them is We've Got Your Back. And in January, they are going to be doing meals for all the families that are part of We've Got Your Back. Every week, we have different volunteers that pack 83 bags of groceries. These are groceries for the weekend that, take, that children take home that there's many different schools that are participating in this. And we want to make sure these families have a home-cooked Christmas dinner, that this is happening on January 6th. But they have asked us if we could help with the cost of that. So there is a sign-up sheet, just if you're able to bring in a bag of potatoes or carrots or peas, or if you like sweets, you have extra Christmas cookies, uh, you can just do a sign-up sheet. If you have any questions, Marilyn Gullison is overseeing that. Just do a little wave, Marilyn, and uh, she would gladly answer any questions that you may have. Again, this is the, today we're lighting. We have lit the Advent candle. We're going to be watching a video shortly about joy. But today is a very joyous day because we have five people, six people that are being baptized today. And I just think it's such an... Uh, yeah, we're really, really excited. But just an, such an appropriate day to do that. It's a day of joy. So let me pray. I'm going to invite our kids just to stay in. I know normally after the announcements they go in, but I'll get you guys to stay for the baptism. And then later on we'll, we'll go to our normal kids program. But let's just pray. God, we thank you that we can come together and just worship you to be encouraged and to be reminded that you are a good, good father. That we thank you just for who you are. May you continue to make yourself known. We thank you for these people that are being baptized today. We thank you for their testimony and how God just, what an encouragement it is to see other people take this step of faith, publicly proclaiming their faith in you. So, Father, we thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I love celebrating Christmas. With a full house of four kids, we find lots of ways to celebrate the season. Baking, presents, special events, bright clothes, lights and music, there are lots of ways to celebrate. I especially love the music of Christmas. The music is upbeat, fast paced, pointing us towards the happiness of the season. But often as we're celebrating Christmas, we fly through the gift of the season of Advent, of slowing down, waiting, anticipating. We get caught up in the rush of the fun. We're so eager to be looking for happiness that we miss out on the joy that Advent points us to. See, Advent is meant to be a slower season than we make it out to be. One writer tells us that in Advent, we learn the joy of anticipation, the joy of delighting in a sense of the presence of God all around us, the joy of looking for the second coming of Christ, the joy of living in the surety of even more life in the future. As we think about joy, our passage comes from Luke 1, 39 to 55, as Mary goes to visit her cousin Elizabeth. This encounter of two women, which could have been an awkward family reunion, became a time of celebration as both women reflected on the joy that they were experiencing. In Luke 1, 44, Elizabeth says, For you see, when the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the baby leaped for joy inside me. Mary and Elizabeth weren't simply celebrating that they were both surprisingly pregnant, they were celebrating and joyful that at last God was acting in their world. They were celebrating because God, the Holy One, the Almighty One, the Faithful One, the Merciful One, was coming into their neighborhoods. In response to all that God was doing, Mary composed a song, often called the Magnificat, a song that another writer calls the gospel before the gospel. 
And in this song, she expresses the reasons why her child's coming were bringing her joy. Mary and Elizabeth believed that Jesus' arrival was showing that all of God's promises were coming true, especially that all the nations of the world would experience the blessings of God's promise. Listen to some of these words from Mary's song. My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior, because he has looked with favor on the humble condition of his servant. He has done a mighty deed with his arm. He has scattered the proud because of the thoughts of their hearts. He has toppled the mighty from their thrones and exalted the lowly. He satisfied the hungry with good things and sent the rich away empty. Those promises were going to make people uncomfortable. Mary and Elizabeth were among the people waiting for an irresistible revolution when the systems of the world would be overthrown by God's Messiah. In the next chapter in Luke's Gospel, we meet another person who was also immersed in the scriptures. Simeon met the young baby Jesus at the temple, and when he sees the baby, he knows who this is. He leans into Isaiah and he quotes a passage that proclaims the salvation of the sovereign Lord. In his song, Simeon sings, Now, Master, you can dismiss your servant in peace as you promised. For my eyes have seen your salvation. You have prepared it in the presence of all peoples, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and glory to your people Israel. Simeon is retelling the story of God's people and how the promises of this story tell us of a great reversal in which the lowly are made high, the high are brought low, the hungry are filled with good things while the rich are sent away empty. The last becomes first and the least becomes the greatest. And this is good news for all people. We know that at this moment, life is becoming increasingly harder for people all around us, even many of us. We long for the stability many of us remember from the past. It seems like the rich get richer while there are more people getting poorer. We see rising homelessness and food insecurity, and we wonder where God is in the midst of this. Can we experience joy this Christmas when there may be less food on our tables and fewer presents under our tree? Mary, Elizabeth, and Simeon remind us that the season is not about fleeting happiness, but it's about real joy that we experience as we come into the kingdom of Christ. This good news of joy is for all people. It's no longer for one specific nation in one specific place, but now it's for all people in all places. Our joy comes as we look for God's activity, as we remember and tell the stories of how we see God entering in our neighborhoods, how we tell others that God is breaking into our world. So this season, may our souls magnify the Lord and our spirits rejoice in God our Savior. As I mentioned today, we have six people that are getting baptized. And it's such a, a joyous occasion because these people are declaring their faith in Jesus Christ. They're declaring publicly their love and their devotion to be able to follow him. And it is such a joy to be able to do this today because every time you see a baptism, it's a reenactment of our Lord's death, his burial, and then his resurrection. And so that they are doing this living testimony, how Jesus is our living hope. And it is my joy that we have a family. We have Connie, Courtney, and Dave Taylor. And so I'm going to start with mom, Connie. I'm going to need to turn around. We've never done this before, so I was like, yep, I'm going to sit. I'm going to hold on to that and then sit. The first person always is the humblest.
Courtney? Courtney, who is your Lord and Savior? Jesus. Upon your profession of faith, it is my joy and privilege to baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. <laughs> I was waiting for a cannonball, really. <laughs> Dave, who is your Lord and Savior? Jesus Christ. Upon your profession of faith, it is my joy and privilege to baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Oh, yeah, I'm going to Here we go. So there was a professional. All right. Now we have Jenna. This is Harriet's granddaughter. That Harriet has been an incredible part of Jenna's journey of faith. You're going to step right up here. Harriet, do you want to come closer? Tears are a sign of worship, people. <laughs> baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Together. doing Harriet's a little bit differently. Harriet had a fall and she has cracked some ribs. And so we just want to continue that healing and not hurt things. And uh, this is just a very exciting day. Harriet has been a follower of Jesus. Long time. <laughs> All right. It is my joy and privilege to baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So Bella's been part of our children and youth ministry, and she went through these baptism classes a while ago, and she just has this beautiful heart to love Jesus and serve him. So it is just my joy. Bella, who is your Lord and Savior? Jesus. It is my joy and privilege to baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. <laughs>
again, just I always get emotional because it's just this beautiful step of obedience that people are taking, that they're publicly proclaiming Jesus as their living hope. And we're excited today to have Jelana here. She's our former summer student and beautiful friend, and she's going to be singing My Living Hope. Thanks, Jelana. Hello, everybody. Would you um, stay seated for this song? And um, it's special to sometimes just listen um, and listen to what God is saying to you as you hear the words of this song. Talk about living hope. We see the living hope through God, through baptisms. So it's just amazing to witness that. So, yeah.
lost his grip on me. You have broken every chain. There's salvation in your name, Jesus Christ, my living hope. Oh God, you are my living hope. Good morning, everyone. <laughs> and it really is a good morning. It's uh, so much good stuff happening uh, this morning. It's been so amazing just to be able to watch these six people get baptized. And I uh, got to give a shout out to Bella because I've hung out with Bella a lot at Children's Church and Youth Group. So I'm just really excited to see that. So yeah, let's give another round of applause for them. <laughs> Of course, our Advent candle today is joy, and it just does bring so much joy uh, to th- see these people publicly proclaiming uh, their faith in Christ. So what a great way uh, to start off our morning. Uh, today, we're going to continue on our Christmas journey as we're in this season of Advent. We're going through the, the story of Jesus coming to earth, and today uh, we're going to be reading through uh, Luke chapter 2. Uh, before we do that, I have to talk a little bit. <laughs> so Christmas season... Uh, is one of my favorite times of the year. As we wind down from the past year and all that it has had for us, we take time to gather together with the people closest to us. Uh, My mom and dad are actually able to come down and watch me preach today, uh, which always makes me feel like I need to up my game a little bit, you know? (laughs) So hopefully the sermon today is uh, of the highest caliber. (laughs) We have lots of fun Christmas traditions that we have in our family, uh, but I think my least favorite one from growing up uh, was waiting for my dad to get up on Christmas morning. (laughs) See, dad's not as much of a morning person as we were um, growing up. I'm not a morning person anymore. Angela can attest to that. (laughs) But growing up, we were all morning people, and dad wasn't so much. So each Christmas morning, uh, we would just be anxiously waiting for him to get up uh, so that we could finally start opening up what was underneath the tree. Uh, And while Christmas is an amazing time of the year, it's also a busy time of the year. Uh, Dan mentioned that again in our Advent video about joy this morning, but it is a busy season of life. Uh, So much goes into the planning and scheduling during Christmas that it can quickly become overwhelming. We've got family Christmas parties, work Christmas parties, our friends' Christmas parties, (laughs) all the shopping we have, the baking, putting up the decorations, et cetera, et cetera. And nothing is more annoying than when our plans get interrupted. For those who have lived in New Brunswick for a while, we are used to interruptions around this time of year. Every year we'll get a few storms during the winter months that interrupt the regular flow of life and put a stop to our plans. But other things can get in the way too. One of the most memorable events of the 21st century so far was a huge interruption. All of us experienced one of, if not the biggest interruptions to our lives through the COVID-19 pandemic. And during the pandemic, much of the world was on lockdown, and so many facets of our life came to a screeching halt. And a lot of people struggled during this time for many different reasons. But one of the biggest reasons has to be the fact that we do not do well with interruption. As we now take time to reflect on the Christmas narrative, we can actually notice how prevalently interruption is interwoven into this narrative. Around every twist and turn of this story, we see one thing or another getting interrupted or not going to plan. So today, we're going to be reading from Luke chapter 2, and we're going to be reading from verses 1 to 7. So if you have your Bibles with you, you can turn to that. It'll also be up on the screen. Shout out to Angela for grabbing your water. (laughs) All right, so Luke chapter 2, verses 1 to 7. So let's read that together. So at that time, the Roman emperor Augustus 
decreed that a census should be taken throughout the Roman Empire. This was the first census taken when Quirinius was governor of Syria. All returned to their own own ancestral towns to register for this census. And because Joseph was a descendant of King David, he had to go to Bethlehem in Judea, David's ancient home. He traveled there from the village of Nazareth in Galilee. He took with him Mary, to whom he was engaged, who was now expecting a child. And while they were there, the time came for her baby to be born. She gave birth to her firstborn son. She wrapped him snugly in strips of cloth and laid him in a manger because there was no lodging available for them. Let's pray. Dear God, I would just thank you for this morning. Uh, as we've already mentioned, our hearts are full this morning, God, just seeing these six people come before you, uh, come before us, showing us their commitment to you, God. God, I pray uh, just to continue to be with them as they go from here. Uh, I pray that their re relationship with you would just continue to strengthen God, and they would just dig into that and, and seek out more of you, God. Now, God, I pray today, uh, as we're heading into your word, uh, that you would just open our eyes what you want us to see. God, thank you for the gift of your son, and, and just pray that as we're learning more about that now, that you would just uh, show us the impact of that, show us the importance of it, and and put that on our hearts, God. Help us to, to be in tune to what you want us to see. So God, we just thank you for all of this. We pray all this in your name. Amen. So I always like making my main point super clear whenever it comes time to do a sermon. And so today is no different. So I'm going to make it super simple. Everyone, if everyone's taking notes, you just have to write this down. You don't have to write anything else down. <laughs> I'm going to make it super simple by saying what our purpose here today is right out of the gate. So the main point I want us to take away from today's sermon is this. Some things we face that may seem like interruptions to us are actually provision from God. So I'll say that again. Some things we face that may seem like interruptions to us are actually provision from God. When we realize this, we begin to realize why it makes sense that this story is so riddled with interruption. The gift of Jesus Christ is the best, best provision we could ever receive from God, as it is God himself coming to earth in the flesh. Interruption can occur when God's plans counteract human plans. A couple passages of scripture come to mind when I mention the plans of God. First is the always comforting Jeremiah 29, 11, where it says, For I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. They are plans for good and not for disaster, to give you a future and a hope. This verse doesn't say that the plans are going to be easy or enjoyable or interruption-free. However, it is made very clear to us that these are the best plans for us. We also read this in James chapter 1, verse 17. Whatever is good and perfect is a gift coming down to us from God our Father, who created all the lights in the heavens. He never changes or casts a shifting shadow. An important part of this verse is to notice the unchanging nature of God. While we may become frustrated with interruptions in our lives, we can breathe easy knowing that the God who never changes and who never gets interrupted is in charge. And not only is he in charge, he also wants to give his children good gifts. Our Advent candle, again, that we've lit today represents joy. And joy is something that God wants us to experience in the full. We are told in the Psalms that God delights in us. We read in Psalm 149, verse 4, For the Lord takes pleasure in his people. He adorns the humble with salvation. Despite all of our mistakes and shortcomings, God delights in us and seeks to share that delightedness with his people. 
while it may seem difficult in the midst of interruptions to see this all the time, we can rest assured in knowing that God wants the best things for us. So interruptions can be a God thing. And in the Christmas story, we can definitely see God intentionally working through disruption. How many disruptions can we see in the seven verses we read today? Before we look into that, we're going to backtrack a little bit to the chapter before. So Mary and Joseph had plans of getting married. And nowhere in these plans was giving birth to the Messiah. (laughs) This news of a baby on the way had the potential to throw everything off track. For Mary, it can mean social outcast. And for the both of them, it can mean losing each other. But that wasn't part of the plan. Like God does for us, he made a way for Mary and Joseph and protected them amidst this monumental interruption. So our first big interruption in our story today comes, unsurprisingly, from the government. (laughs) Because nobody interrupts things quite like the government does. (laughs) Emperor Augustus has decreed that all must go to their own ancestral towns to be registered for this new census. For Mary and Joseph, this is no small journey. Did you know that the car drive between Nazareth and Bethlehem now is less than two hours? And I never thought I'd use Google Maps for preparing a sermon, but I guess there's a first for everything. (laughs) So it's less than two hours by car, but if you're walking, it's 34 hours of walking to get from point A to point B. This was no doubt an annoying interruption for Mary and Joseph, especially considering how their lives had already been so suddenly interrupted with the news of Mary soon giving birth to the Messiah. Yet this interruption is vital to the narrative of the Messiah. Look at what we read in Micah chapter 5, verse 2. But you, O Bethlehem Ephrathah, I think I said that correctly, are only a small village among all the people of Judah, Yet a ruler of Israel, whose origins are in the distant past, will come from you on my behalf. The significance of Bethlehem is immense, as this humble town was prophesied to be the birthplace of our humble Savior. So while for Mary and Joseph, this may have just seemed like one more massive interruption, we can easily see God at work amidst this. We see yet another interruption when Mary and Joseph arrive in Bethlehem. After a long and tiring journey, the couple is most likely looking forward to settling down for the night and resting at an inn. Unfortunately for them, everyone else has the same idea, and there ends up being no room for them. So with baby on the way, Mary and Joseph end up having to spend the night in a barn. Not the best place to give birth. I wouldn't recommend it. (laughs) Perhaps at this point, The couple is questioning what is happening here. Mary is giving birth to the Son of God. Yet the situation seems all but special. Something of this magnitude, something that the Israelite people had been waiting for for so long, feels like it should have some more structure to it. Yet despite this, at every turn, there seems to be another interruption. What could possibly be the point behind Jesus being born in a manger? In one commentary on Luke, author Beth Kreitzer writes, The disparity between the wretched situation of Mary, birthing her first child in a dirty animal pen, and the divine significance of the event, heralded by throngs of angels singing beautiful praises to God, was not lost on these interpreters. When she says interpreters, she's talking about the people who wrote the book of Luke. God does not work on human timetables or according to human reason. Even the shepherds, humbled people themselves, were not expecting such a miserable situation for the promised Savior. And yet their faith, like Mary's, was strong. Christ's desperately humble beginnings should show us all the extent to which Jesus humbled himself for our sakes, taking on this temporary lodging so that we might have permanent homes in heaven. End quote. The humble beginnings of Jesus show us the will, and the heart of the Father. Rather than accepting the broken state of reality, God makes a way through Jesus to regain that deep, 
personal relationship with us. And that comes in this humble arrival to earth. When I was going to university, uh, one of my favorite subjects was always English. And so whenever I had a free elective to take, I would usually use it to take an English course. And so because of that, I thought it'd be fun uh, to read uh, you guys a poem from the 16th century by poet John Donne, very 16th century name. <laughs> and this poem just further describes the humbleness of the situation. There's a lot of silly old words in here, so <laughs> bear with me as I try to read this, uh, but we'll get through it together, right? So it's called, God Almighty Becomes All Weakness for Us. Immensity cloistered in thy dear womb now leaves his well-beloved imprisonment. There he hath made himself to his intent weak enough now into our world to come. But oh, for thee, for him, hath thine no room? Yet lay him in this stall, and from the Orient, stars and wise men will travel to prevent the effect of Herod's jealous general doom. Seest thou my soul with thy faith's eyes, how he which fills all place, yet none holds him, doth lie? Was not his pity towards thee wondrous high, that would have need to be pitied by thee? Kiss him, and with him into Egypt go, with his kind mother, who partakes thy woe. Okay, that wasn't too bad. <laughs> I just really like this, because it again just shows uh, the humbleness of the situation. And I really enjoy the line, the line uh, where is it? There he hath made himself, er, no, sorry. <laughs> Seest thou my soul with thy faith's eye, how he which fills all place, yet none holds him doth lie. God is everywhere, yet in this beginning to the Christmas story, he has no room. There's no room for him. It's just a really interesting thing to think about. So God can work through interruptions, and we can trust that he does have a plan. But that doesn't always make it easy to wait so let's quickly go back to roughly a couple thousand years before Jesus enters the scene to look at another biblical example of interruption. As Moses and the freed Israelites make their exodus out of Egypt and into the wilderness, they are looking forward to new beginnings and entering into the promised land. But things don't go according to plan for the Israelites, and many become disobedient to God and God's plan. Because of this, the Israelites are forced to wander in the wilderness for 40 years before they are allowed access to the promised land. And this has got to be one of the most well-known, as well as lengthiest, interruptions that we see in the Bible. Something similar happens much later in the narrative of Israel. As the people stray further and further from God, the powerful Babylonian Empire comes and conquers the Israelites and forces them into exile. For those who had to live through these experiences, there are most likely some who are wondering why God was allowing them to live through times like these. But this is another thing God can do through interruption, and that is work on us and our point of view. As fellow people, we all know how easy it can be come to start thinking too highly of ourselves. And sometimes interruption can cause us to dig in deeper to our relationship with God. I really appreciated this prayer I heard once from my buddy Josh, shout out Josh, <laughs> um, where he asked that we may dig into our relationships with God without having to be brought down through a valley. And what this means is, is that we come to God without having to be humbled in this way, because sometimes that is what it takes. While God wants to prosper us and give us joy and the best life we can possibly have, we could sometimes get in the way of that. Interruption can help us to realize our need to trust in God, the one who never changes. So don't be so quick to look negatively at an interruption. Going back to the examples we were just looking at, while well, the things that the Israelites faced were definitely negative, they still led to amazing provision from God, who ends up giving them the promised land and bringing them back out of exile. Like we said earlier, God wants to give his children good gifts. So during the rest of this Christmas season, 
Let's not be scared or upended by our interruptions. I want to once again mention our crew of people who have been baptized today. They have made the conscious decision to interrupt their regular schedule in order to come before you today and, pro- and proclaim their faith in Christ. See, interruption could be a positive thing. It could be a powerful thing. Interruption and the change that can come with it can be the cause of lots of anxiety and worry. But today, I challenge you to embrace the interruption. Remember that God, who is ultimately in control of our lives, has good plans for us. Plans to prosper us. Plans to bring us joy. Plans to save us. So as we get closer and closer to the celebration of Jesus' birth, the greatest, most life-altering interruption of all, remember that God is in control of all of our interruptions. Let's pray. Dear God, we just come before you and say thank you for being in control. God, we've all faced interruption. Maybe we think back now upon this past year and think about the interruptions that we've had in our lives. The, the times where maybe life has come to a halt, where things have just had to stop, where things haven't gone our way. God, I just pray as we think about these things that we could just recognize you in that, God. Help us to see you amidst the interruption. God, we just want to feel your presence as we deal with these things. We invite you to further come into our lives. As we prayed earlier, we want more and more of you, God. And so I just pray that as we continue during this Christmas season, that you would just continue to fill us more and more up with your presence, God. Remind us constantly about the reason for the season, that Jesus has come to save us. God, we just thank you for this. We pray a blessing upon the rest of the service. In your name, amen. Okay, we invite you to stand, and uh, we'll do our last worship song of the service.
You never stop working. You never stop. You never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop. You never stop working. You never stop. You never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop. You never stop working. You never stop. You never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop. You never stop working. You never stop. You never stop working. No matter what journey that you find that you are on, that Jesus is with you. May the grace of Jesus Christ and the love of the Father and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Have a great week. God bless.